In this episode, we discuss edge computing for the industrial internet of things. We talk about the key drivers for the deployment of compute capabilities at the industrial edge, the IIoT edge computing technology stack, distributed edge computing model for IIoT, and the building blocks for artificial intelligence at the industrial edge, among many other topics. My guests on this episode are Dominic Pilat, who is the field CTO at HiveCell, and John Kelfayan, who is the Vice President of Energy, also at HiveCell. HiveCell is a complete edge-as-a-service solution that allows companies to process vast amounts of raw data from smart machines and IoT devices in real time at the edge. It is both a hardware and software solution that supports the most widely used platforms today, such as Kubernetes and Apache Kafka. Quick thank you to our sponsors. This episode is made possible by our friends at HiveMQ, who are providers of an enterprise-grade edge and cloud-based MQTT broker, and up to 22 manufacturers of reliable industrial controllers for automation and IIoT applications. So please do check them out to help support this podcast. Welcome to the fourth generation podcast here on industry 4 tv which is a series of weekly interviews designed to help you learn industrial IoT from some of the world's leading practitioners. So make sure to subscribe and click on the notification bell to make sure that you never miss any of the interviews. If you find this conversation interesting, please review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, and also connect with me on LinkedIn at Kutzai Mandi Teresa. Now, here's my interview with John and Dominic. Okay, so John, Dominic, thank you so much, guys, for joining us today on the Fourth uh, Generation Podcast. I would like to welcome you to the show. Thanks for having us. Hi. Okay, so today I would like us to discuss uh, edge computing for the industrial internet of things. So uh, perhaps you could begin by explaining to us uh, what are the key drivers for deployment of compute capabilities at the industrial edge? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you think about the industrial space, and if you tell someone from that industrial space that you are doing edge computing, they're going to tell you, that's what we've been doing for the last <laughs> decade. <laughs> Look yeah. at this. This is a PLC, right? It's a piece of edge compute. It, it, it runs this line, you know, this manufacturing line. And we have hundreds of those you know, uh, on, on, on our factory sites. And we have hundreds of factory sites all over the world. So we're doing distributed edge compute. And, and that is true. That's very true. This is, this is edge compute. Um, however, this is a different kind of edge compute of, of what we are talking about now. Um, so while the, um, the, the industrial space have developed this compute that is perfect for reliably running um, uh, manufacturing lines, the IT guys have developed all sorts of other capabilities. On the IT sector or in, in the IT industry, um, people have come up with how to develop complex software, how to containerize this software, how to come up with new ways of, um, of, of developing it faster, closer to, to, to the customer, things that, that we are absolutely used to as, 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 as people. Like when, when we log on Netflix or Amazon or whatever, we are used to that this software is updated 50 times a day. We, we, we don't even notice it, right? But, but all the time we get new suggestions, we get new kind of input from that, that side. These are small little updates that are only possible because the uh, software um, has been uh, developed in an agile way um, in yeah, cluster distributed containerized compute. And on, on, on another subject, analytics. If you ask someone from, from the industrial space, hey, are you, are you guys doing analytics? They will always say, yes, of course, we're doing analytics, right? They, what they're doing is um, uh, engineering-based, physics-based, model-based analytics of their systems. Okay. Something I, I used to do very well, right, in science or, or, or engineering, you model the system, you think about, hey, how does this, you know, thermodynamically work together, mechanically work together? Okay, this is the formula. We can use it for our data. We can prove it. And it would be a big no-no in science to go the other way around, to have the data and say, let's just throw this equation at it. Let's see whether it fits. You know, That's yeah. a big no-no. You have to have a good reason. On the IT side, 
there has been uh, this, this, this capability developed called data science, which does exactly this big taboo. <laughs> they take huge amounts of data and, and just see what, what, what fits this data. How can I describe it, right? Um, and they've been doing that for, for it, it worked perfectly for, for, for credit data and, 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 and you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you know how the model looks like, whether it, it, it is true through some, some modeling reason, if you can predict whether someone will pay back their credit or not. If it works, that's all that counts. So data science has worked out, you know, to get huge amounts of data, crunch them and predict basically the behavior of a system. Now, the moment you want to combine these two, it gets complicated. And um, this is what Industry 4.0 is all about, right? It, you're not bringing computers. That was Industry 3.0, bringing computers to, 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 to the manufacturing net. 4.0 is getting all of these capabilities in there. You're connecting it all and getting these uh, uh, capabilities in there. And now, if you want to do that in a factory, if you want to crunch huge amounts of data if you want to um, um yeah get, get get insights from that um of course the first moment you say okay we can just push it to the systems where the it guys sit anyways the data center or the cloud have it there and you know analyze it and i've seen many companies do that in 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 in, in my in, in the last five years um, very often it's just ETL tools, you know, you just get some data from here, from there, put it in the historian yeah. and, you know, co collect it, have, have one CSV file or one database filled with it once a day. It's updated and the data scientist can just, you know, take it on his laptop or on his NVIDIA DGX machine or whatever machine he uses to do data science with and do his compute. And it's wonderful and the data scientist will crunch this data and he, he will come up with some insights that will make the manufacturing process go go faster quality be higher uh predict the outage of of of, of, of uh, equipment whatever then he will present that data to 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 his uh product managers and they will say this is great this is awesome we need to have these insights within an hour or within a few minutes because knowing while the process is running knowing within a minute that the quality will be bad on that batch that is valuable yeah. Knowing this information half an hour later, you have produced half an hour of inferior quality of your product. Knowing this a day later is worthless very often, right? So you want to have that insight right there, right then on that data. And getting that to work in these networks, right, where you have this, you know, maybe older equipment or maybe not, you know, the, the full IT capabilities at, at, at there and getting all, all of it transported to the cloud or the data center is very cumbersome. And operationalizing machine learning models then close to where the data is generated might be even more complex. And that's where edge compute steps in. That's where they say, why do we push it to the cloud? Let's just take a piece of cloud and put it right there next to the manufacturing line, right? And have it, have it easy to, to, to get the data streamed in there, have, it, have options there to, to, to aggregate it, you know, work with it, push it somewhere else, have their aggregation uh, done there. Uh, use models that are running right right on on, on edge there um which comes with all kinds of uh benefits you you get independent of the internet you get independent of of opening up firewall ports you have a higher availability and um, yeah these are these are basically the 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 whole process or the whole big movement of getting the it world and the ot world yeah Oh no, OT world I had all the time here, how IT world here. And getting them <laughs> getting them to work together. Um, I think edge compute is a conclusion from these two worlds trying to work together. Oh, yeah. okay. One one other component of that is just data volume, right? You know, at the the edge, one of the one of my more favorite slides that we use in some of our decks is basically two atoms colliding, right? And it's data machine learning and AI and IOT, right? And so you've got this incredible amount of growth uh, that's already occurred. You know, the volume of data just in the last 10 years has grown 50 times. Um, and it's obviously not going anywhere, but a lot of that is due to the growth in IOT devices and sensors and all of that stuff. And, uh, you know, I'll, I think next year, uh, one of the big consulting firms expects that almost 50% of the data generated is going to be generated outside 
the cloud, the traditional cloud, right? So that's going to be coming from you know IoT sensors, devices, metadata, et cetera. And so a lot of that data, though, is fed into an algorithm, a calculation, a model, et cetera. And then all the client or the business user cares about is the output of that algorithm model calculation. The input of the data that comes into that doesn't matter, uh, or it's not as it's not the business important uh, data that they care about. So pushing all of that irrelevant, quote unquote, irrelevant data that feeds a calculation into the cloud is just wasting money at the end of the day, when if you could do it locally and then just push up the output from that calculation to the cloud, that's really what you care about. That's what the users or the rest of your company cares about. That saves you a tremendous amount of money. Uh, I think a lot of people are, are overlooking the fact that uh, the cloud bills are going one direction and that's up um, and there's basically no end in sight. And then you pair that with a lot of these new sensors, you have very, very high volume, high frequency recording, you know, hundreds or thousands of Hertz. Uh, that's a lot of data just by itself. And then you combine that with a bunch of other data. And then you're trying to push that up to the cloud through, you know, basically a fixed pipeline uh, and enable it using edge enables you to use, utilize uh, much more of your data, much more effectively and efficiently. It's a better, good way to say that. Okay. Yeah. That's Really interesting. So now when it comes to the implementation, uh, uh, what does the, the industrial IoT edge computing uh, technology stack uh, look like to you? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's, and you're very right to make this distinction. There, there is a difference between edge computing per se. Um, there is also a big space of, you know, what, what is defined as edge, but then again, how you use it in, in the industrial space. Um, let's just follow the flow of data. So right now you have a lot of data generated at the machine or at the manufacturing line, which essentially all goes through the PLC or, or some kind of you know, PLC hierarchy. And um, if you wanna implement edge compute, of course you need to connect to these data sources. So you will need to connect to PLCs, you will need to connect to, to maybe uh, aggregate systems or even sensors. So the first, thing and that, that that is for for many people the only definition of edge compute um having an iot gateway that connects to these right so having a gateway that speaks modbus or or profinet or opc ua or whatever on the one side and the other side and it protocol mostly mqdt that, that the, the you know that protocol is the winner right now um uh, that presents the data to, to the it side so that is absolutely a fundamental component of an industrial IoT stack, somehow being able to connect to that data, connect to that network, speaking that language of, of, of machines over there. And then from a technology stack, you need some kind of component to, um, to do actual computing on edge. So to do, to do the actual crunching of data, which can be as, as low level as aggregating the data, yeah, you're, you're doing mean values, standard distributions, doing um, just, just, just creating thresholds for the data. Yeah, so only send me this data when it goes above that, right? Thresholds, having this kind of logic implemented um, and gets as complicated as a neural network running there, right? A, 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 a complex data science algorithm that, that analyzes all kinds of variables and then creates insights with, yeah, the most complex models thinkable right now. So you need this kind of um, compute capability down there. And at the same time, orchestration capability on the edge, because you will not be running one or two softwares. I mean, of course, there are aggregate softwares that, 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 that can do many of these things, right? Where you just have one piece of software that can do thresholding and some kind of modeling or whatever, but very often you will have multiple applications that need to somehow feed up that software uh, that might crunch it, that might maybe display it, right? Because you might want to have a dashboard right down there. So you will need to have some kind of orchestration layer for software on the edge. And now you don't just have one edge side, you have hundreds of edge sites. So, and, and you don't have hundreds of IT departments all locally sitting there, right? Uh, then, then it wouldn't be the edge, then you would just have your IT right next to whatever. But you have a limited amount of resources that can actually, you know, control or, or manage this, 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 this environment. So you need a management layer 
that is not run on edge, that somehow is run centralized, that can run in the cloud in some ways, sometimes it runs in your private cloud, in your data center, but you need some kind of management layer to be able to, yeah, distribute op OS updates, to distribute software, manage software, distribute configurations. Um, and when we're talking about edge compute combined with analytics, then very often what we see is that people have an aggregation layer of data. I mean, you, you still have your data lake or data hub, right? Where you're running a centralized Kafka or, or a centralized whatever store, yeah? Uh, where you crunch your data on. The, the, the overall you know, uh, term in, in data science is Lambda architecture. It, it's the same architecture that Amazon uses and whatever, you have a batch layer where you crunch the data and then you have a serving layer, a speed layer, where you just use the model that you analyzed in order to produce results. And now this batch layer, of course, you still have the running of the model, you then again can do on edge, right? So this is kind of the, the data flow of, of, of it all. And of course, with everything that comes around it, like if for, 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 for that, you will have to have user management, yada, yada, yada. But from edge specific components, that is the technology stack. Oh, okay. Well, so there you mentioned the fact that uh, you, you are likely to have your, your software running in like 100 uh, edge sites or something like that, which obviously has got some form of uh, distributed computing going on, uh, which is not something that uh, comes intuitively, you know, especially when building industrial systems. Uh, so could you maybe describe for us like the, the characteristics of a, a distributed edge computing for IIoT? Yes, absolutely. Like the maybe one of the biggest things that you that, 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 that needs to like like that, that, that is the change of perspective you're not building an edge device that will that 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 you generate code for and 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 then deploy and it'll run for five years ten years whatever right this is this is this is embedded compute right embedded computing you need to make sure you go through a vigorous process of of, of, of generating that software of testing it very very well and then it goes out there and it runs yeah, for a long, long, long time. Edge compute is, is the other paradigm. It's, it's the exact opposite paradigm. You are generating software that you're updating all the time, that is connected to you all the time. Data scientists don't work with the V model, right? They don't work with, we're going to make the perfect model, then deploy it, put it out there, and done. Yeah, and runs for five years. They, they want to update their models monthly, weekly, sometimes daily, right? The batch changes. Let's, let's update the model, right? Let's take the time to update the model. Um, again, websites do that all the time and we're used to it, right? They do 50 updates a day yeah. and we don't even notice it. And this is the big difference uh, in characteristics of distributed edge compute. And now getting all of this not in a centralized place like Amazon, Azure, or whatever, where you, where, you, where you know these kind of automations work in order to make that work, but getting it out to the edge, that is the big the big, uh, the big challenge here. And how it's typically handled is having management layers, management layers that uh, these, these management systems that can connect to all of these uh, edge computing nodes and then take care of updating the software there, of, of having a CI CD flow, yeah, uh, semi automated or even fully automated CI CD flow that goes down to the edge. Oh, okay. All right. So, well, I mean, you've touched a bit on, on, on the fact that, you know, uh, the advantage of, of cloud computing is the fact that everything is in one central server, you know, so it's easy to manage and monitor. So obviously, if it's now at the edge, you've got a lot of different components scattered across uh, different even uh, geographical areas. So could, could you talk to us about uh, how one could go about managing and monitoring software that is distributed, perhaps maybe focusing on the on the tools that you, you'd use to, to do that? Yes, yes. I, now the way we do it, we give our uh, um, companies the way of, of, of managing every node, yeah, every cluster and every node, but also group management capabilities. So, because sometimes you need to go on the node because you have a node specific issue to resolve, like some kind of IP issue or whatever. It's just this side. And sometimes you just want to have an op operation, you know, running. On, on, on everything. Uh, and the way we do it is you, you can manage every layer of it. You can, you can, you can manage when you, when you have you know, hundreds of no, uh, clusters out there in the field, you can deploy uh, 
runtimes on, on a group level. So you can say, hey, I want to deploy Kubernetes on all of these nodes. Yeah, we want to deploy Kafka on all of these nodes. You don't want to do that per node basis. So we, we have uh, automated that and, 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 and uh, given, um, yeah, uh, a group uh, functionality into that. And yep. then of course, you want to be able to uh, manage the containers, the software that you're running. Uh, so what we did is we have implemented uh, tools like, like Rancher for, for container management on Kubernetes um, that see every node that is connected to that specific tenant and where you can then manage the software running on it. Um, now, when it comes to management, a big yeah, big part is deploying software edge. And I, and, I, and I touched briefly on, on, on the issue of, of how do you do CI CD down to, to edge? Um, what is possible right now? Right now, you can have two ways of CI CD semi, semi automated and fully automated uh, down to the edge. Basically, your CI CD pipeline works the way that you, you, you know it, you know that, it, that, that you're using it, and you deposit images to a repository, which you then connect to our management plane. And then you do one click and deploy it to whatever edge site you want. What also works is you do all of this and have an automated API call. So you don't have to go into the graphic user interface. It just deploys you know, the, the code down to the edge. However, this is when you start, you think that the journey is finished there. I mean, this is how we do CI CD. We're happy it's running on a server. The moment you do edge, you realize how messy it is. And one of the, one of the things is every edge site is different. Um, you have different IP settings, you have different sensors running there, you have different um, Bandwidth, machinery connectivity. Running. Exactly, connectivity, different machinery even, right? So you need some kind of metadata handling, yeah? Um, in order to be sure the right model comes or the right software comes with the right configuration to the right edge gateway. To the best of my knowledge, this is something no one has solved yet. In case someone is watching this and has solved it, please contact me. <laughs> but we are right now working on that because we, you know, the moment you, you start doing Edge seriously, you run into the real life problems. And this will be one of the big next steps, making management of deployed software on a node basis, like, like aware of, 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 of the location it's going to uh, possible. Oh, okay. I mean, well, talking about uh, messy, you know, uh, industrial data is typically, it's, it's, it's messy itself, you know, it's, it's, there's many different formats uh, from many different sources, you know, so like, I, I'm, I'd like to find out about the data governance uh, approach as far as, as industrial edge computing is, is concerned. How, how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, data governance, um, it, it has at least two dimensions, right? And one of them is, of course, the process side. When you are an organization, you need to make sure that you have processes in place in order to secure your data, uh, ensure uh, in, in, in integrity of your data, and, and yeah, privacy, all of these things. Um, the other part is having best practices um, and having ensured that best practices have been used when, um, well, when creating software or, 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 or any tools that you are using. And we are trying to employ as many best practices as possible on, on, on our level. Uh, for example, um, we authenticate every single node on a hardware basis. So uh, there is a hardware generated key um, that, that, that every, every node, by the way, I'm, I'm always just looking over here. They're, they're just standing here. This is why I'm looking at this oh, stack, right? So, nice. so, so every one of these nodes, yeah. Um, has a, a hardware generated key uh, I, I, inside it and, and this they use to, to authenticate and say, yes, I'm here and I'm allowed to talk to this network. The moment you tamper with that node, like for example, you're a hacker, right? And you're, you're, you made your way into one of the industrial manufacturing sites and you brought your laptop and you are trying to somehow flash a Kali Linux, you know, instead of our OS into that node because then you can attack everything. Um, the key doesn't work anymore. The, the node is not authenticated, you know, and it's just not recognized. So, so this is one of the ways of, 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 of protection. Of course, we offer uh, um, uh, encrypting data, right? Uh, en encrypting the data that, that, is, that is stored on, on a Hive cell. It comes at the price of, of, of 
that always you know encryption always comes at the price of, of of lower compute lower performance so we have customers who choose to encrypt we have customers who choose to not encrypt um then another thing is that we separate very clearly between the management traffic and the operational traffic right so there is the, the management of the of the of the hive cells this traffic is a completely different network than um uh, the, the 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 traffic that actually crunches the data and uses the industrial data, yeah. So so whoever manages your 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 platform does not have access to your data. A big important thing to 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 have and, and ensure. And um, of course, we take care of or we help our 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 customers to take care of data integrity. Um, a big yeah. part of that is just bringing edge and storage compute. I mean, compute and 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 storage to the edge where um, well if it wasn't there and you had to send it over the internet and the internet is gone, you lose data, right? So this is the first thing. And then on a cluster basis, whatever we do and whatever software we deploy, we make sure we have a replication of storage. So in case a node fails, you know, you just have your, your, your data replicated there. And I think to that point, a lot, there's a huge push obviously from all industries. People want to, you know, leverage machine learning and AI People are pushing to automate systems more and all of that stuff. But uh, the big, in my experience, coming from the energy space, there's the biggest problem with doing that typically comes from the fact that the data that you're trying to build the models off of or the real-time data that you're getting that's feeding those models, th there's quality issues with it, right? Whether that's missing data points, you know, all the way up to structure issues and, and that sort of thing. One of the most interesting things that I have seen our clients uh, resolve is simple, basic ETL data quality checks and, and things like that. You do it at the edge, right? Like the, the cloud has become, you know, we've literally created the term data lake in the cloud because there's so much data. The data lake has become a dumpster fire because it's just push the data up there and then we'll figure it out later. We'll figure, you know, we'll feed the model what, but we just need to capture the data first. Well, if you're capturing bad data, going back to every math class that anyone has ever taken, garbage in equals garbage out. So if you're feeding your cloud with bad data and then you're building models off of that bad data, your data is going to be, your models are going to be bad. Um, or if you've got a good model and the data that's being fed into that model is bad, it's not going to be what you want. So being able to do those those e even simple basic ETLs or quality checks on the data and stuff ahead of time uh, enables you to actually focus on, enables the data scientists to focus on the problem and not going in and cleaning up and ETLing or replacing data points or stuff like that. I mean, there was a stat at one point in time in the energy space that our data scientists were spending 80% of their time fixing data errors, right? And it's like, you can literally automate it with edge to say, Hey, if it doesn't pass these checks, if, and then I can also ETL it to be exactly how I want it to look when it gets to wherever it needs to go. But if it doesn't pass these quality checks, let the data scientists know that, Hey, this chunk of data or this part of the data is not good. And it's going to stay local until somebody comes and fixes it, but push the good data up. And so now you're isolating, Hey, just this piece of it is bad instead of pushing all of the data up and then letting somebody find it, you know, who knows how long in the future, once they finally look at it or run some checks or whatever on it that way. And so that's, that's a really big, I think, component that the edge offers. Uh, Cause I think there's a misconception that people think edge is going, trying to replace the cloud uh, that might, might happen in, you know, the long-term long future, but that's a whole nother conversation. But what it is doing in the short term is it's making the cloud significantly more robust it's allowing us to have, to, to Dominic's point, you know, uh, there's a lot of SCADA systems in the energy space where it's a push only, right? So if there's no connectivity, there's data being pushed, but it's not going anywhere and there's no check to see if it got received. Well, if you had an edge device there and it did was running something as simple as Kafka, like we offer, if there's no connectivity, it just runs it and stores it locally. And then when there is connectivity, Kafka automatically backfills that data and there's no gaps, there's no missing data, there's nothing. Um, so data quality is such a overlooked, but important part, I think of what edge kind of brings to the table. Okay. Well, we've, you've brought up in an interesting, uh, 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 
technology there. I mean, Kafka, even, even Dominic earlier on uh, uh, referred to it. So maybe let's let's dive into uh, Apache Kafka a bit. You know, like why, uh, precisely why would you want to have uh, Apache Kafka at the edge there? And what does that architecture look like? In general, the value proposition of Kafka is it's a streaming data platform and at the same time an integration platform. It, it does something that many other tools also do, but it does it all at once and extremely high performant and reliable and you know all these things that you want to know, uh, want to have. Um, and um, well, what 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 does it do in general? Right, you 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 just write um, data into Kafka. Um, the Kafka brokers take the data and write it right to disk yeah uh, and and then uh, make it available for yeah all kinds of other applications uh, to use that data um, kafka writes that data into um, yeah immutable logs so so the called topics and then partitions um, where you just can be sure hey everything that that was generated is also there right it's 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 it's, it's like you know a, a ledger um, and um, you can do that at in incredibly large speeds and volumes. Uh, it scales very, very well. So, I mean, it's the backbone for LinkedIn. That's where it was developed. It's the backbone for many, many big applications out there. We have all kinds of data streams coming together and you need to present them to your, to your um, well, to your data scientist eventually who, uh, who, who, who makes models out of them, who, you know, create insights. And, um, what, why is that important for the industrial space in general? And why is that important for, for Edge? Um, in my opinion, Kafka is an incredible tool for generating any digital twin. Because of this, it, and it's not, it's not a, a typical database or whatever. You just really, you log everything into it uh, and it's there for you to, 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 to use at an incredible speed and incredible, yeah, uh, also when you use it, ease of use. And um, so this is what, what people have been doing. They've been using Kafka for, for predictive maintenance. They've been using Kafka for, for optimizing quality um, on their site. Um, and um, by the way, uh, if you want to learn more about that, my, my, my good colleague uh, and, and field CTO of, of, of Confluent, um, the guys who are bring enterprise Kafka to you and make it a bit easier to use, by the way. Um, Kai Vener, uh, he has written a lot of blogs, about, uh, blogs about, about, about how to use Kafka in the industrial space. And um, he's also written a few blogs about how to use it on, on Edge. Because the moment you're realizing, hey, wait, I can use that as a digital twin, um, you might realize, hey, how does this scale if I have 100 factories? Do I want to have all my digital twins and all of this information in the cloud? Or does it make sense to have the complete digital twin, you know, on edge and, 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 and you know, generate insights there, generate, uh, you know, uh, uh, value right there at the edge and, and maybe just have um, an aggregate and high level information in the cloud. And that's what you can do with Kafka. You can run Kafka on multiple sites uh, and you can replicate that data um, into a centralized cloud. You can do full replications, yeah? Uh, or you can just, yeah, send aggregates into, into a centralized Kafka. Uh, many people just use Kafka Cloud, uh, Confluent Cloud, yeah, which is, which is a fully managed Kafka broker. So you don't, you don't even have to do, uh, well, any of the heavy lifting of, of having it run somewhere. You just use it. Um, but um, yeah, uh, and on the other side, you, 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 you can have Kafka running on premises in, in a factory. However, um, that, all, that, that, that right or, or to the point or, or up until one or two years ago, it came with the task of building up an infrastructure in order to run Kafka there and then also managing your own Kafka on premise, which is a task that you might be able to do on a few sites, especially if you have very good staff you know, there. Um, but once you want to do that on multiple sites, hundreds of sites, it gets complicated. Um, even if you can remotely connect to everything, it just gets complicated to do that. So one of the big things we have done is we've put Kafka here, right? So, so this thing is actually right now a running Confluent cluster. Um, I have deployed it. <laughs> And I, I have, I have, you know, I have no idea how to deploy it properly, but it 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 is deployable through our platform. So it it is a you know click 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 deployment. You say hey, run it, uh, make it run on 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 Kubernetes and and have it there. 
And uh, this thing can literally be used anywhere. You can, you can put it right there on the factory floor. You can put it right on your remote site. You can manage it from the cloud and you can get the management also as a service from, from us. So we will make sure you have your Kafka running, your, your Confluent platform running wherever you need it to run, you just utilize it. And then all you do is you populate your digital twin, you use the data, you, 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 you crunch your numbers, you uh, use your machine learning models that, that, that will feed off that data, you replicate whatever you want to replicate into Confluent Cloud or, or you know, any centralized Kafka unit and have this incredible, well, uh, um, I would say data hub, right? Because that's the moment where you not only have data at rest, you have data that is written to disk. So the rest part is there, right? So you, you, ha you have all of the data, it's persistent, but you have all of the data that's coming in and that, that you can use right now in order to generate insights. So that, that is the idea of yeah, Apache Kafka used at the edge in the industrial space. Oh, okay. That's, that's interesting. All right. So, well, how does the edge computing uh, enable artificial intelligence at the, at the, at the industrial edge? So I, I will just give you an example. Um, it was this, it, it's, the same, it's the same story. Um, you want to optimize a manufacturing process and you're able to collect the data. Um, you might not be able to collect it at, 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 the, at the right timing. So we already talked about that, that the edge enables you to con collect data where it's generated and, and, and then form aggregates and, and things like that. But the moment you want to operationalize artificial intelligence, it gets very tricky. What I've seen people do is um, they would do data science on, on, on their industrial data and start with simple data science models, something like um, decision trees. So decision trees are essentially case structures. Yeah. So if one of these cases happens, you go in the next level and, uh, you know, if, 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 if if the temperature is like this and the pressure is like this, and I don't know, you're using this and this kind of material, explosion, I don't know, right? So, so yeah. it will just be a, a very, very simple and human understandable thing. And then what, what, what you can try to do is, in order to operationalize this model, this knowledge that you've just created, right? So you have decisions you can make in order to get to favorable states of your process. You can think about, okay, if I want to operationalize this, I'll put this knowledge into the ladder logic on the PLC, right? So then, I mean, the, the PLC is ladder logic, so, so this, this should, in theory, work. You can do that, and then you have the PLC with, you know, better logic running on edge. Um, what, what happens there is, first of all, right now there are no tools who do that for you so if you want to do you know translate this model into plc logic you have to do that by hand you know you have to somehow break it down uh, come up with the system uh, do that by hand but let's say even if you could do that um and and build some kind of software that could translate and then have that new updated plc logic running there controlling your your process um you will be limited in what you can use as the model, the data science model, because the moment it gets more complex, right? I mean, then you, you, you have something like regression analytics. Okay, this is also somehow described with equations. Then you have support vector mis machines where people could argue, okay, there's also a way of, of taking one of these models and, and, and dumbing it down a bit. But the moment you get to neural networks, which are the most effective models, yeah, especially on huge amounts of data, when, once you pass a threshold of how much data you collected and everybody passes the threshold at, at some point yeah um then you uh yeah you, you you can't argue against uh, neural networks because they are the most effective at getting the insights and creating the models that in the end do the value and getting a neural network into a plc is, is very tricky um so one of the ways of doing that is having a piece of edge compute there and that piece of edge compute will run the neural network and will then be able to in some way interact with the PLC, something that you would never let the cloud do. And right now, I mean, right now, many, many manufacturers feel iffy, you know, having any system interact with the PLC. So, so of course you would build up something like um, you have, in, the German word is Leitstand. So you have, you have some kind of place where you, where you control, you know, the, the, the manufacturing process, but we're still a person looks at the recipe you're running on the PLC or whatever. And then you can have the machine learning model make a recommendation, what kind of recipe should be run and, and, and a person, you know, clicking a button saying, yes, it makes sense. 
they wouldn't have come up with that model, but they can verify, okay, you know, this will from 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 this kind of you will never have a cloud doing this kind of recommendation, but yeah, you, you can have an edge device do that recommendation. And at some point, when we you know get the regulations figured out and 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 evolve uh, machine learning, evolve you know uh, all of these things, um, we will be able to do to run that autonomously. I mean, even now, if internet is gone, the cloud insights are gone, but the device running on edge can still give recommendations. But the moment it controls the process or it starts to somehow, you know, optimize the process by itself, which we are very close to again, on the technical side as possible, it's more, you know, regulation side. Um, you don't want to be dependent on the internet. You want to have a self-driving line, yeah, manufacturing line, a self-driving oil rig, a self-driving whatever, yeah. Cool. It's better to not be dependent on the internet. Tesla has figured that out. Any manufacturer of, 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 of self-driving cars knows that, you know, you need to have the bulk of your compute happening there on edge. And it's the same for any other edge or for any other application that, that, that needs to somehow get in this direction of auton uh, autonomy. Yeah, to, to Dominic's point, going in and, and prog programming PLCs by hand is also not a scalable thing, right? Like, Okay, it, but that's the, that's what's been happening in the industrial sector and in the in the energy sector. Um, you know, you have guys that have to drive out to the the plant to the wellhead and manually program these PLCs. Whereas if you put edge compute out there, you can now put all the logic. You could put more of the logic or the models into the computer, and then you could also manage that remotely. Um, you know, and, and again, it it also opens up the door for you know federated learning models and things like that to accelerate that process as well and to dominic's point the i think a lot of people you know think we're going to go from manually doing things to okay it's just automatically being done by itself through automation and you know the, the way that the most of the real world is working is machine learning models are you know making recommendations or giving diagnostics that say hey user this looks bad do you want to do something about it or do you not want to do something about it? And the, the user says, yes, it, it makes the change. If they say no, it doesn't. But at the same time, underneath that, they're recording the user's behavior so that it is now training the model. So it is this you know, closed loop system. So as the user trains the model, the more it gets fed, the better the model becomes. And then that's going to ultimately lead to the full blown automation where the user no longer has to touch it. Um, and so that's, that's, but that's the first step is, you know, the, the diagnostic piece and the recommendations and those things. Oh, okay. That's, that's interesting. Okay. So when it comes to deploying, uh, the artificial intelligence, uh, applications at the industrial age, uh, what sort of hardware would be required for such kind of applications? Yeah. So the, the, the answer that, that I'm guessing any data scientist doing edge right uh, will give you is some kind of gpu uh, enhanced hardware so you want to run you don't want to run your machine learning models or the inference of your machine learning models uh, on cpus you want to run them on gpus um, so the go-to thing to use are nvidia jetsons uh, and nvidia jetsons jetson boards so currently we have uh, uh, an nvidia jetson board uh, tx2 uh, in in our hive cells um, the next generation of, of, of these guys will have the Xavier um, in them. And that, that is, that I would say that is the basis of any edge deployment, just having that capability in it. Now, the next part, you know, um, is something that, 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 that is not very often, um, that when you're starting on, on a project, you don't, you don't think about it that, that much, but you might think about clustering. Uh, because you might think about um, well running running this this kind of data in in a cluster in in running multiple uh, uh, machine learning models on edge running multiple machine learning models on the same data on edge all of these things right when you start small you you, you might just need you know one Jetson board one I don't know compute box but the moment you really want to utilize the edge you don't you want, don't just want to have one edge box per use case you want to just have that deployed uh, yeah infrastructure working for you you think about scaling and um, well one one thing that we've done in order to 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 make it as easy as possible to get clusters on edge and and scale as easy as possible is we've created our our own connecting system that these nodes use to connect uh, to towards each other so you have the Baranovsky connectors which are give you power through the stack and network through the stack and our um, nodes basically just click onto each other so 
The design goal was make it so easy that anybody can install it. Anybody can install, not just a node, but a cluster, a compute cluster. And, and I think that is a big thing. You want to get out there on the edge. You want to do GPU and has compute. You want to do it cluster, right? The way that big data works today. And it should be that you as a data scientist or you as an IT guy do not have to drive out there. Do not have to do it. It should be as easy. So these are some hardware considerations that we have absolutely considered uh, and make sense. And I think that they make sense for the edge in general. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So maybe so that we can uh, give the audience a, a clear picture of what we have been uh, uh, discussing from since the beginning of this talk. Could you perhaps give us a practical use cases of, of industrial edge computing? Absolutely. Uh, I'll jump right in. So we've got a couple of different ones that I'll, I'll hit on real quick. Uh, one of them is a uh, one of the a large manufacturer that we're working with that is looking to utilize acoustics on their rotating equipment. So they're actually putting uh, microphone arrays out on their factory floor and on their equipment and recording the audio of the equipment and what it sounds like. Um, and what they're doing is using that audio to feed machine learning models that will ultimately end up being their predictive maintenance models and predictive failure models, right? And so everyone knows, uh, at least in the industrial space, you know, you've always, you go to a plant and there's the 40, 50 year old or 50 year plus foreman that walks around and can literally hear if the piece of equipment isn't operating correctly. <laughs> yeah. This this client literally just wants to make that a digital process so that it scales and it doesn't go away when he goes and retires or he, you know, it it's doing that human to human. That would take, that takes decades of experience and actually physically being there and doing it, it's very hard to teach. Whereas by digitizing it now, you're able to leverage, uh, leverage that basically infinitely without having to uh, wait uh, and, and physically gain that experience. Um, another one that we've worked on with was with a large steel manufacturer. Um, they wanted to validate and, and, and understand the quality controls of, of their steel as early as they can in the process to prevent it from you know, getting further down the manufacturing line, which ultimately ends up resulting in waste because it has to be reworked again anyway. Um, and so they were using computer vision models, uh, looking for defects you know, in, the, in the steel as it comes out of uh, the kiln and the, the kiln during the process. And so they were using computer vision models. They actually trialed running those models exclusively in the cloud, running them in a cloud edge hybrid infrastructure, and then running them all at the edge. And the results of their kind of tests were uh, that in order for them to catch it fast enough to divert it from the line quick enough, uh, it, every, those models needed to be run at the edge. And so that's what, what those guys are doing. Um, you know, the, the use cases for quality control and in, in manufacturing are endless though. I mean, with computer vision and the ability to have highly available edge compute right there, uh, you know, <laughs> it, 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 you're really, really starting to get into some, some really cool stuff just because of what that enables. Um, we're also working with some clients in the energy space. One of them um, utilizes uh, natural gas, creates that, in, or they have generators that utilize natural gas in the oil fields um, that turns into electricity. And then they use that electricity to run the next generation of drilling and frack and completions equipment, um, you know, as a way to reduce uh, the carbon footprint, but also as a way to you know, reduce the cost of, of uh, diesel fuel um, that they're no longer using. Well, their entire control system runs on a hive cell cluster. Uh, and the reason they did that was because they had to have a highly available, redundant, fault tolerant, fail proof solution uh, because they're dealing with live natural gas. I mean, worst case scenario with that is a explosion. There's death, you know, environmental risk, all of that stuff. And so having high availability Kubernetes cluster running where if one of the nodes did fail, everything fails over, you're not worried about you're losing control of your, uh, of your equipment, um, even with the, you know, the built-in battery backups and stuff, right? Like all of that is extremely critical to operations like that. So um, anytime you have, you know, those critical operations or control systems that failure is literally not an option, this is a, a very, very good solution. Um, we're also working with a couple of clients, uh, both in the energy sector and other sectors, um, around being able to deploy 
kind of what we talked about earlier, pro diagnostic uh, models to users in kind of pseudo disconnected environments. So, you know, for example, in the oil field, you might have kind of uh, a disparate uh, or intermittent, you know, internet connection, right? So you might have it one day and the next day it goes away the next day it comes back, et cetera. Well, they wanted to deploy, you know, the learnings and these machine learning models that they had built in the cloud back at the office. They wanted to deploy that knowledge to the field. So the guys in the field can use it to make the decisions because the guys in the field are the ones that actually have the hands on the equipment. And so doing that at the edge enables them to have those insights without having to have connectivity at all. Right. So you, you're able to transfer that knowledge of the masses of the company, of all of your data sets back out to, you know, the individual locations and the actual user who's using the equipment, who is, you know, you're trying to get to make real-time changes to the operation or to your manufacturing uh, line. So those are, those are just a handful of use cases. There's, you know, the really cool part about the edge is the longer you sit there and think about it, the more use cases you can come up with. <laughs> uh, but it's, that, that's the exciting part. That's also why kind of our form factor is, is such a great thing because, as you sit there and think about it, the more use cases come up, right? And so yeah. that's one piece of the infrastructure problem, especially with edge that uh, is worth noting, right? You know, the more, the minute you get infrastructure in place and you have one use case, it's a waterfall of other use cases typically come after that. It's like, oh, well, if we can do that, then we can also do this and then we can do that and then we can automate this. And so having something that is scalable out there where you don't have to send out a technician to add another rack server or anything like that makes the process much, much easier. Okay, yeah, well, that's, that's interesting. Those were quite uh, compelling uh, use cases. So maybe let's, let's, talk, let's talk about the, those colorful uh, boxes behind you there and uh, the complete uh, solution, uh, what you, you term the edge as a service solution. So maybe you can just give us a breakdown of, of, of that offering. For sure, yeah. It's think of us as as infrastructure edge as a service. It's we're literally doing what the cloud did for the data centers, but now on prem. Um, so everything we do is as a service. So you don't own the equipment. And some people might think, well, why would I ever do that? You know, that's that's not the way we've always done it. Um, and so the <laughs> the benefits of that are are numerous, right? So what that means is that we handle all of your OS patches and updates. We handle all the framework patches, updates, and licenses. So the licenses are included. Um, if the hardware itself fails, we replace the hardware. It's part of your, just like just like in the cloud when you, know, you don't even see it because it's in AWS's uh, data center. But if one of their servers fails, you never see it. Your experience never changes. And that's exactly what we're aiming to do with our stackable cluster design. Uh, at the edge, but again, if the hardware fails, it's part of the the, the as a service offering that we replace it. Um, and then, if you're on a long term uh, contract, we'll replace the hardware, uh, or not replace it. We'll upgrade the hardware every three years. So it's an evergreen uh, model where uh, you know you it's as hands off and as uh, worry free as possible. But the the one of the big objectives of that is to essentially accelerate enable the acceleration of, you know, innovation, right? So enable that CICD pipeline to be continuous, right? Because as Dominic has mentioned, IT and OT can sometimes have their, have their, uh, you know, conflicts with each other. Um, what we enable is the ability to uh, deploy and provision uh, not only remotely, but also at scale, right? So you can do this at one cluster, or you can do this at the same time on thousands of clusters with our uh, backend management layer called Hive Control. Um, and then lastly, you can do all this behind the firewall because of the way that our communication system works with the Hive cells. Um, it enables you to be behind your network or even potentially somebody else's network, but still enables communication with it. And so you can SSH directly into them if you want to. Um, and that's a you know very powerful thing because as we all know, networking can be fun and tricky. And of course the IT and security guys don't like to open up uh, yeah. any of those things. And so we don't have to deal with that with, with what our, our solution is offering. It's basically the same thing that, that MQTT promises, right? Or MQTT does. This is why, why in my opinion, MQTT is so much more um, uh, widespread in the industrial IoT space than OPC UA. 
because before obviously the way how they started was you have a server right uh, and, and you have to you know the client would have to have access to that server in order to get data from it and then if, if this you know a client from the cloud calling a server on prem never going to happen so you know people would run mqtt clients that connect to an external broker the same way our our with the same idea our our hive cells connect to the management plane uh, so if you're using mqtt inside your factory floor you can also use hive cell inside your factory floor and have it managed worldwide and um one more thing um that i just want to stress because this was amazing for me before i started with hive cell um this here is a managed kafka confluent platform right so we i mean if you buy one node from us then of course then you can run a kafka on it uh, you can run you know software and whatever you, you will not get it as a managed service managed service means um uptime guarantee if this thing fails it fails right you have a downtime until the new unit is shipped but the moment you have a cluster you can have it with an uptime uh, guarantee right with an sla the thing that you want from the cloud you can get at the edge from us we run the cluster for you we run the kafka for you you don't take care of it you don't have to you know we just take care it's a uh, managed service operational service however you want to call it right with an sla yeah. um so when i learned about that i it was mind blowing to me because that means if you are doing your your um, industrial iot project you can basically just swipe a credit card and order a Kafka on-prem, order a Kubernetes on-prem and go crazy, right? Yeah. Don't, don't have to care about it. Don't have to yeah. manage it. Awesome. Yeah, we're, we're, we're democratizing the infrastructure, right? I, I mean, this is, I am the definition of this. I'm a mechanical engineer. I was a mechanical engineer because I like, I have to see and touch the things that I understand. I love physics, hate chemistry. <laughs> right like doesn't make any sense i have no business being able to set up a kubernetes cluster i i don't program i don't code we've made it so that i can set up a kubernetes cluster literally in 15 minutes with no knowledge of what i would even do with that and and that's what we're trying to do the you know we're doing what the kind of low code no code software yeah. of the world is doing but for the infrastructure piece oh okay that's interesting and maybe just for interest sake, I don't know if you touched on that part a bit. Uh, what are the specs uh, for 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 the highest cell box for one box? Do you like yeah. have them handy? Yeah. So we've got uh, two models. Uh, our Horizon model, which is our ARM uh, based model, it's got a six core CPU, a two hundred fifty six CUDA core NVIDIA GPU, eight gigs of RAM, half a terabyte SSD hard drive, um, built in battery backups. Uh, the other one is our perimeter model. It is an x86. It is, I believe, eight CPU cores, 32 gigs of RAM, and a terabyte of NVMe. Um, and again, that's per node. So it linearly scales as you add more nodes. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So in uh, conclusion, uh, can you tell us uh, briefly about uh, HiveCell, the company? For sure. HiveCell was founded back in uh, 2015. Um, by our three co-founders. One is a mechanical engineer who has been in the software cloud space. One is an electrical engineer who's been in the electrical avionics aviation space. And the other one is our uh, software architect. Um, and so it, it's really a very nice combination of, of both mechanical, physical form factor, electrical efficiency and electrical components and design and then the software component as well so it's, it's been a very nice uh marriage as far as those go um, we've got offices uh, across the us as well as in uh, the ukraine um, and we've got a, a long list of software and hardware partners that we're constantly looking to expand so if, if you've got a containerized service or a virtual machine uh run service that you're looking at uh, potentially deploying at the edge, or if you're a software company that you have clients that want to deploy at the edge, uh, give us a shout because we'd love to be that easy button for you. Okay, awesome. All right, Dominic, John, thank you so much, guys, for taking time to share your insight with us on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Cheers.